There we go. Well, my brother Priest, greetings from the Mount, everybody. I'm going to do a little introduction and then hand this over to, to Brett Brennan for uh, a wonderful retreat, I'm sure. Um, I'm so glad that you've been able to uh, participate uh, in this retreat via Zoom. Um, because of um, some COVID restrictions, and they're beginning to wane, as we all know, um, and the fact that there's a, a number of large capital projects going on at the seminary, we were taking advantage of this ideal time. It's left us without air conditioning. I do have an air conditioner in my office in the window. Um, we, we've got new windows that have just been put in. We, they've taken off the, uh, the seminary off the entire HVAC system because they're replacing the steam um, power to natural gas. If you might remember, there's a steam plant all the way over in the other end of campus that was being piped underneath the campus and being used to power our air conditioning and heating unit here in the seminary for many, many years. Well, that was a, of course, you can imagine the kind of waste uh, that, that that caused us and, and the expense. So uh, we're being taken off the steam line because of the great generosity of our donors to the forward capital campaign and being put on a natural gas boiler line. And the natural gas boilers are gonna be right here in the seminary. So much cheaper, more efficient and easier to uh, manage and, and fix and, um, and take care of. Um, and then also the sound system right now in St. Bernard's Chapel is out because we had a donor give us money to upgrade the sound system. So all of that's kind of taking place. So I really appreciate the fact that um, you're able to join us uh, in this retreat via Zoom. Now, before introducing our illustrious retreat master, uh, I just wanted to review a few things uh, as we begin this retreat. You, First of all, you should all have received, and I know you have because you're on right now, the Zoom link from Marianne Shields. Uh, all the conferences uh, this week will use that link uh, for you to join the conference. I would ask that during each one of the conferences, if you could please mute your audio so that the background noise that might come and go uh, in your particular place would not interfere uh, with our conferences. Um, as you know, the, the schedule for the retreat conferences are as follows. We begin tonight at seven o'clock. Um, the morning conferences will be at 9.30. Again, morning conferences at 9.30 tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And the evening conferences will be at 4.30 on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, which basically means, of course, our last conference, as usual, is at the Friday morning conference at 9.30. All conferences will be approximately 30 minutes, 45 minutes, or if Brett wants to go on, maybe two hours. I don't know. Um, before the last conference on Friday, uh, I'll provide everyone with a little bit of an update on what's happening here at the seminary and, of course, express uh, my gratitude. Um, and so now I'd like to introduce to you uh, our known and in many ways well-known retreat master, Father Brett Brennan. Um, I did not know this, but I, I believe, Brett, you were born in Louisiana, not Georgia, um, but moved to Georgia when he was very, very young. Uh, his mother is a Catholic. Uh, his father is still still Baptist, I believe, um, and has he has two brothers and a sister. He's a 1991 graduate of the Mount, uh, the same year as I. So happy anniversary, 30 30th anniversary to you, Brett. Uh, and is a priest of the Diocese of Savannah in Georgia. Among his various priestly assignments, including vocation director of the Diocese of Savannah, he served for several years here at the Mount as vice rector. Uh, Father Brennan is now presently the Director of Spiritual Formation, if I have that title right, Brett, Director of Spiritual Formation at the Pontifical College Josephinum. Now, before, before joining uh, the formation faculty there at the Josephinum, he was pastor of the Most Blessed Sacrament uh, Church in Savannah. We all know, I'm sure, uh, that he is author of To Save a Thousand Souls, a guide for discerning a vocation to diocesan priesthood. So many of our men and I'm sure you, maybe even you or other men, young men that you know, uh, has uh, uh, that book has deeply affected them and helped them in their discernment. Um, but he's also uh, author of another book called A Priest in the Family, a guide for parents whose sons are considering the priesthood. And I've been approached by a number of parents uh, of semin present seminarians who have expressed their gratitude uh, to Father Brandon for that book. It's been very helpful to parents and families. He is, of course, a very avid and constant supporters of vocation to the priesthood and religious life and discernment. Uh, he does travel the country, maybe before COVID, was doing a lot more traveling than he is now, um, giving retreats to priests and to seminarians. So 
We're very, very privileged to have him here with us via Zoom for our annual alumni retreat. So without further ado, uh, Father Brett. Thank you very much and uh, welcome everyone. I'm very happy to be with you. It's the first time I've ever done a retreat uh, via Zoom. So uh, we'll see how that how that works out. I can see you. Um, I've done many retreats for priests. I just came back from Portland on Friday, Portland, Oregon, I was with the priests there. And um, I, I love I love priests. It's a vocation within my vocation to take care of my brother priest and retreats and spiritual direction. And um, so I'm really happy to be with you this week. I'd like to begin by reading from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. I thank God in all my remembrances of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, and making my prayer with joy, thankful for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure that he who has begun this good work in you will bring it to fulfillment on the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel thus about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve what is excellent, may be pure and blameless on the day of Christ, filled with righteousness through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be Thanks to God. Be. Brothers, there's a story in the life of St. Ignatius Loyola that when he first went to study to become a priest, he was already a little bit older. He went to Rome. He rented a hole-in-the-wall room, began to try to study his Latin. And there was a wealthy widow woman who could see there was something very special about him. And so she knew he needed support, and so she gave him a big sack of money. And he carried it around his belt as he came and as he went to pay for his books. He lived very simply. And one day his landlord, noticing that he was carrying all this, this sack of money around with him, he said, why don't you give me that and I'll put it in my safe and then I'll give it to you when you need it so you don't get robbed. And St. Ignatius was so trusting. He said, what a great idea. And he gave the money to the landlord who went out immediately and spent it on whiskey and prostitutes. And one month later, it was time for Ignatius to pay his bill, his, his rent. He had no money. The landlord kicked him to the street. St. Ignatius Loyola said, Jesus, I forgive him. I know you'll take care of me. And we all know that Jesus took care of St. Ignatius Loyola. He founded the Society of Jesus. He's done tremendous work in the church. But the most wonderful part of that story happened some 20, 30 years later. Ignatius heard that this man, his former landlord, was dying all alone without any faith. And Ignatius Loyola left immediately the town where he was. He walked the 90 miles back to Rome and he moved in with the man. And he cared for him until he died with all the sacraments of the church. My brothers, isn't it wonderful to be a Christian? To live this superior life called Christianity. Isn't it wonderful to spend our lives trying to become like Jesus? San Alphonsus Liguori said, if you add up all the goodness of all the saints, it would not equal the goodness of Christ. What an amazing statement. Look at the goodness right here, this retreat. You men who love the Lord, you love his church, giving your whole life to bring Jesus Christ, his teachings and sacraments to others. The goodness of Jesus is greater than the teaching than the goodness of all the saints put together. And that's why St. Bonaventure said, if you learn everything except Christ, you learn nothing. If you learn nothing except Christ, 
you learn everything. Christ is the only teacher. Christ is the only lesson. St. John Paul II says, the only success recognized by God is Christ's likeness. That is our goal. One of the things I'm going to say to you again and again this week, my brother priest, is that what God is doing in you is more important than what he does through you as a priest. And he does powerful things through you. But what he's doing in you is your first vocation. And that is holiness. We all know that Christianity changes everything. It's like walking into a dark room and turn on the light. C.S. Lewis wrote, I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen, not only because I can see it, but because I can see everything else by it. Christ changes the way we look at ourselves, the world, sin. He changes the way we look at everything. He changes the way we think. And he desires to possess us. And that's why the Lord says in Revelation, Behold, I make all things new. Jesus can make everything new. How long you've been a priest, whether you're doing well or not well right now, if, the, if you're doing fantastic or the wheels are coming off, nothing is so broken, Jesus Christ can't fix it. Nothing is so twisted, he cannot untwist it. If we make ourselves radically available, a great Spanish word, disponible. I know we're in, on a, a different kind of retreat. We don't have the mount. We don't have St. Bernard's Chapel, and we're not able to go up to the grotto. But you know what? Jesus Christ can overcome all that, can he? He can give us the graces that we need right now at this time in our life. So I've got a lot of good news for you this week on this retreat. But the first good news is this. A good retreat does not depend on a good retreat master. It depends on you showing up and being radically available and letting the Lord give you the graces that he wants to give you. I don't know if you've heard of Mother Olga Yakob from uh, Iraq. She's a dear friend of mine, really a little Mother Teresa type of sister. And she's been present in a number of retreats as a prayer warrior. Uh, and I've developed a great friendship with Mother Olga. She grew up in Iraq in the time of Saddam Hussein. She was allowed to go into the prisons, not as a Christian, but as a humanitarian. At a time when prisons were like, as she would say, Father, prisons in the United States are like country clubs compared to prisons in Iraq. She said they're like medieval dungeons. There's no running water. There's no electricity. It's horrible skin diseases. She was there once and she was talking. Most of the prisoners were Muslims. And she said that uh, she was speaking to a Muslim. The Muslim man had a pamphlet about the Catholic Church he was looking at. And he said, Mother Olga, he said, Catholic Christianity, Catholic Church is easy religion. She said, why do you say this? He says, I'm reading here that Catholics only fast on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. And what is this about? You may eat one meal not to equal two or something. He says, during Ramadan in Islam, we eat nothing from the time the sun rises until the time the sun goes down. He said, Christianity is easy religion. And Mother Olga said, well, let me give you one teaching of Christianity. If you can live that teaching until I return two weeks from now, I will acknowledge that Christianity, what you say. He says, good mother, what is this teaching? She said, love your enemies. Pray for those who hate you. The man said, Jesus taught that? He said, yes, he did. And, my, and, the, and the Muslim looked around and he said, my mother, these are animals in here with me. I cannot love them for two minutes. How am I to love them for two weeks? And Mother August said, well, then even though you may fast more in Islam, please do not say Christianity is an easy religion. Become like Jesus changes the world. Nothing is more foundational. When I talk about if you're losing in football, you go back to the ABCs, blocking and tackling. If you're not doing well in your faith, you go back to the very basics, right? The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 8. 
Father uh, Monsignor was telling you a little bit about me. I'll tell you just a little bit more. He said my dad is still Baptist, so he does go to Mass every Sunday with my mom and the grandkids. I told him, I said, Dad, I said, you know, if you wish to become a Catholic, you're at Mass every Sunday. You know, I could make that happen. I am a priest. And he said, I'm thinking about it. I'm like, well, you better hurry up. You're 83. <laughs> but he's a great man, and he, he was a great gift to me. He taught me how to work hard on the farm. And I'm so grateful my mother. I was the only Catholic in my school, my brothers and sisters, and I, I never stepped foot in a Catholic school until I came to Mount St. Mary's Seminary. So I was the token Catholic. And um, I left the seminary twice. Monsignor uh, very kindly didn't mention that. Twice I left and always say that my bishop and formators deserve to go straight to heaven just from having to deal with me. I really struggled to say yes. Kept looking back. But in hindsight, God was preparing me not just to be a priest, but to be a formator of other priests. For really about 20 years of my 30, I've been directly involved in priestly formation and caring for my, my brother priest. I love being a priest. Couldn't imagine doing anything else. I'm so grateful to God. He did not let me throw it away because I tried to a number of times. I think Mother Teresa says the reformation of the church always begins with the reformation of priests. It always begins with us. And we're always having to look at ourselves honestly, aren't we? And ask the Lord to give us the grace to be the priest he wants us to be. Father Grishel told me once he picked up Mother Teresa at the airport. And as soon as she got in the car, Mother Teresa looked at him and she said, Father, why did God call you to be a priest? And you know, Father Groeschel had such a great sense of humor, that New York sense of humor. He said, I don't know, Mother, probably because she has a sense of humor. He has a sense of humor. Well, Mother Teresa was not amused. She looked at him and she said, Father, God called you to become a priest because he's merciful. First of all, he's merciful to us because we don't deserve to be priests. We're not worthy to be priests. And secondly, God uses us to bring his mercy to his people. So what a wonderful blessing it is to be a priest. A good retreat does not depend on a retreat master, but it does depend on you showing up and making yourself available. St. Ignatius said that disposition is almost everything. It's not everything. Jesus is everything. But disposition is almost everything, meaning being radically available. You go into a restaurant and the coffee cup is turned upside down on the table. What do you do? You turn the cup up to signal the waiter or waitress to please come and bring you some coffee. A retreat is nothing more than taking the coffee cup of your soul, turning it up and allowing yourself to be filled by whatever God knows you need. My job as a retreat master, I always say when I give priest retreats, I have four jobs as a retreat master. Number one is to love you, to will good to another and to provide that good if one is able to love you, to care about you, to desire everything Jesus desires for you. Number two, to pray for you. I have 450 children in my Catholic school here at Blessed Sacrament and um, they've prayed for you. They put your name on their whiteboards, the priest of Mount St. Mary's and, and their prayers. This is how I always make sure a retreat is successful before I ever arrive. Have the children pray. Number three, the least important is to give you a series of conferences to try to just get the Holy Spirit moving in your prayer time. And number four, to be available to speak with you for spiritual direction or confession, not going to be possible with Zoom. I will give you my number if you would like to text me and set up a phone conversation. My cell number is area code 706-513-4660. Repeat 706-513-4660. So if you'd like to talk, text me. Be happy to do that. Archbishop Fulton Sheen has a great line. He said, every retreat master is charged with giving his retreatants two pats on the back, one up high with the hand, the other down low with the foot. 
You know what I mean? We all need to be encouraged, don't we? We work hard and it's a mean world out there and it's a very toxic world right now to our Catholic faith. We need to be encouraged. It's a very positive retreat. But number two, we also need some ideas for resolutions so that we can be that best priest that God is calling us to do. So I'll give you a few conferences. St. John Cardinal Newman once said with his great wit, and I quote, the human mind is a marvelous thing. It first becomes active in the womb and remains so until one is called upon to speak in public, unquote. Brothers, feel free to use anything I say this week that you might find useful in your own retreats or homilies. Anything I say, feel free to use under one condition. Don't say that I said it because I stole it from somebody else. The Dominicans used to teach us uh, at Mount St. Mary's when I was in the seminary and the Dominicans have a little joke. They say, all work and no plagiarism makes Jack a dull preacher. Always love that. St. Bernard of Clairvaux writes, we must be a reservoir before we can be a conduit. We have to be filled, don't we? We have to, Holy Spirit has got to come and fill us so we have something to give. We learned in our first year in pre-theology that famous Latin expression, nemo dat quo non habit. One cannot give what one does not have. And on retreat, we are reminded that Jesus is what people want. Jesus is what they need. And God has configured the heart of a priest in a special way to bring Jesus to his people. And we'll be talking about that especially uh, this week and especially tomorrow. Whenever I would go on retreat with my brother priest in Savannah, there were seven things that I always really wanted when I would leave to, as I would leave the retreat. What were those seven? Some of them won't work because it's, number one, I wanted just to get away from the daily grind of parish life. Something very important to get away from that parish, isn't it? Uh, in order to be able to, it's a, sometimes, especially with something like the Mount, it's a social retreat, isn't it? Time to get to see each other, catch up on old times. Number two, to laugh and have some fun. To feel good about being on retreat with our brothers. Did you know that the average adult laughs approximately 17 times a day? The average child laughs over 200 times per day. Isn't that amazing? Jesus said what? We must become like the little children if we want to enter the kingdom of God. So as George Santayana wrote, it's easier to make a saint out of a libertine than out of a prig. If we can't laugh at ourselves and at our world, right, around us, we're not going to survive as priests. And that's very important. G.K. Chesterton put it this way. You know why angels can fly? because they take themselves so lightly. So that's important, isn't it? That we'll be able to laugh a little bit and I'll tell you some jokes and some anecdotes and some things. Number three, time to just pray. Be quiet with the Lord, some spiritual reading, but extended quiet time, wherever you are for this retreat. I'm gonna invite you to put on the holy handcuffs. Do you know what the holy handcuffs are? Only you can put them on yourself. The holy handcuffs are, you are on a retreat. Unplug your computer, not your computer. Unplug your phone. Uh, don't answer emails. Don't do business. Give yourself as a gift to Jesus. He is never outdone in generosity. If you give yourself and make yourself disposed, I promise you, he will give you great graces. Oftentimes on a priest retreat, the first thing to do is get some sleep isn't it? Because oftentimes we don't sleep well in the parish because one thing after another. And so it's important to make sure you get, take a good nap, get rested, and then pray well. Number four, some good stories, insights, and anecdotes that will inspire me to be a better priest. Okay, I'll use some of those. Number five, I always wanted practical recommendations to be a better priest. Nothing super intellectual or theoretical, but what I call meat and potatoes Catholic priesthood. 
solid resolutions. Okay, I'll, I'll make lots of suggestions so that the Holy Spirit can guide you. And I'll ask you, I'll invite you on this retreat to make two primary resolutions. Number one, I want you to start doing one thing you're not doing that Jesus wants you to do. Number two, I want you to stop doing one thing you are doing that he does not want you to do. And please don't jump and say, oh, I already know what they are. Please let the Holy Spirit speak. They may be completely different than the thing you're thinking of. Maybe one of the resolutions will simply be about changing your perspective, how you see things or how you think. I love the story um, Archbishop Flynn used to always tell about about, or maybe it was Colonel Malley, about Diogenes, the philosopher who was once sitting in the roadside in the dirt, eating a bowl of cold gruel. One of his rich friends rode up on a white horse with his gold chains, and he looked at Diogenes in the dirt with disgust. He said, Diogenes, if only you would learn to flatter the king, you would not have to eat that gruel and Diogenes looked up from the dirt and said, you have it all wrong. If only you would learn to eat this gruel, you would not have to flatter the king. My brothers, our perspective is a very important part of our holiness. How we see the world. Do we see the world through the eyes of, of Christ? I say to our seminarians, I said, if Jesus Christ is not your consuming concern, a bad start is a quick finish, we Irish say. If, if academics are your consuming concern in the seminary, work will become your consuming concern as a priest, and you're wrong in both cases. Jesus is your consuming concern. Holiness. And then you'll be a holy priest, and God will use you very powerfully. Cardinal O'Malley writes, holiness is less easily acquired than theological fluency. A lot of people that have doctorates in theology, but they don't know Jesus. It's possible, isn't it? It's possible. And holiness is much more different. So I have a priest friend who's really a great mystic. He said to me one day, he said, he said, you know, Brad, he said, I've reached a point in my life where I can no longer say, Jesus, I love you. I looked at him kind of funny. He said, I've reached the point I can no longer say, Jesus, I love you. All I can say now is, Jesus, I love you too. Because he's always telling me. He's always showing me. Every time I walk outside, every time I see a child walk up, we miss so much. God's yelling at us as he says to St. Augustine, I scream through his, God scream through my deafness. So to be aware, spiritually aware, St. Augustine says there are two books that God has written, right? The book of creation and the book of sacred scripture. And we want to learn to see God and find him in both. Number six, I always wanted to go to confession, receive counsel from a brother priest or from the retreat master. At least for counsel, I'll make myself available for that. And finally, number seven, I always wanted to leave the retreat really joyful and drive back to my parish or my assignment to really love the people, not just to do my duty, but to really love them. If I were to ask you, rate yourself right now, zero to 10, how joyful are you as a priest? And the good news, we have the greatest news in the history of the universe. Christ has risen from the dead. Our salvation has been won. How joyful are you? I would like to encourage you to increase that by two digits on this retreat with the grace of God. A decision to be joyful because of the good news, the gospel that we bring. St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta used to say there's only three steps in the spiritual life. Number one, loving trust. Number two, joy, uh, 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 total surrender. And number three, joy. Loving trust in Jesus, total surrender to his will, whether that's his permissive will, his active will, right? 
And number three, the great joy that we see in the missionaries of charity. So my brother, St. Teresa of Alba said it well, the only mistake we ever make is taking our eyes off of Jesus, but we do take our eyes off of him, don't we? I do. In the midst of our crises and busyness and rushing from one thing to another, we often lose our peace because we take our eyes off of him. Let's resolve on this retreat not to take our eyes off of Christ. Archbishop Robert Carlson, the very just newly retired Bishop of St. Archbishop of St. Louis, gave a retreat uh, many years ago in, for my diocese. And one of the things he said, I'll never forget. He said, I am constantly amazed at the number of men who are priests who would did everything in their power they would not be. I'm one of them. Constantly amazed at the number of men who are priests who did everything in their power they would not be. The point is that we all have a story of how God called us. And some of them, or maybe some of you are lifers, and maybe it was a lot easier than mine. Maybe you went to high school seminary, college seminary, theology, straight through, no problems at all. Maybe some of you were like me. I didn't go in until after college, and I left after first theology, left a second time. Our, our vocation stories are all very different. There's an expression in theology. The mill of God grinds slowly, but exceedingly fine. We've all been through the mill of God, haven't we? And God has used that to stretch our hearts. You'll hear me talk about this tomorrow, but the two things that stretch our hearts and get us ready for heaven are, I always say the two things are mental prayer and suffering. Those, when God stretches our hearts and he fills us with himself, that process of magnanimity, greatness of soul. So we all have our vocation stories, but we made it, guys. We went to the cathedral. We uh, anoint, we, we consecrated ourselves on the floor for the litany of saints. We placed our hands between the hands of the bishop who said to us, do you promise respect and obedience to me and my successors? And we responded, I do. And what did the bishop say? May God, who has begun this good work in you, bring it to fulfillment. That is the title of this retreat. May God, who has begun this good work in you, bring it to fulfillment. My brothers, God is not called the best to be his priest. We know that by now, don't we? We have clay feet. He knows, he, he calls weak instruments. This little lady in one of my parish used to always say, Father, with a great Southern accent, she would say, Father, God can do heart surgery with a butter knife. That's what she'd say. I would say, yeah, I'm living proof of it. God can use weak instruments to do great things. St. Padre Pio says you don't have to be worthy. You just have to be willing. You have to be available, radically available. My brother's one of the things that, I love that little expression, you know, I finally reached the age when I can clearly recall how little I knew when I knew it all. Isn't that true? As we get older, we look back and realize how little we are how nothing we are before Jesus, how we need him for every breath and every second. Brothers, I can't save anybody. I can't save myself. I can't save anybody. And the purpose of the priest is not to save people. It's to bring people to the Savior. And that's what we do as priests, isn't it? We bring people to Jesus. I'm aware that in any given presbyterate or a group of alumni like we have before us, illustrious Mount St. Mary's Seminary alumni, I'm aware that you would be in very different places, spiritually, physically, psychologically, emotionally. Different categories. Maybe some of you are just young, newly ordained, excited, and life is great. You, can't, you're, you love being a priest. And there may be others on this retreat that are barely hanging on. On every retreat I give, I talk to some priests that are looking for reasons to stay. I think most of us are somewhere in between, aren't we? Things are not great, but they're not terrible. But kind of keeping up one's enthusiasm is difficult. That comes from that word enthusiasm, comes from the Greek. It means to be possessed by God. Many priests feel what I call over and under. You know what that means? 
overworked, underpaid, overstressed, underappreciated. And maybe some of you are physically sick, trying to deal with that reality. Some are sad or lonely. Others are many years in the Lord's service. And maybe you have come to this retreat in part to prepare for your death. I like to say that a priest's life is like the four quarters of a football game. One to 25, first quarter. 25 to 50, second quarter, when most of us are ordained, right? The third quarter is to 75. And of course, most of us aren't going to play most of the fourth quarter, are we? But whatever we really need to accomplish or we want God to accomplish in us, it needs to happen in the third quarter. My experience is that's when I see many priests really take significant steps forward. And I think the first and most important um, precept of that process is don't despair of holiness as a priest. No matter how long you've been a priest or no matter what you're struggling with, don't despair of holiness as a priest. Jesus Christ can change everything in one instant. And it's never, it's never too late. So I'm going to try to speak to each of these places, possible places during this retreat. And um, it's a retreat I've tried. So wherever you might be to give fodder for the Holy Spirit to speak with you in your prayer. I want you to try to spend three to four times as much prayer as you usually do. All right. We're on a retreat. If you break a holy hour every day, I want you to try to spend four hours. You can make one of them walking outside. You can make one of them in the chapel. You can make one of them somewhere else. I don't care. But I want you to give Jesus his time. I'm going to uh, give you a, an article to read every day. They're not long articles, but again, fodder to get things, get you thinking, right? The first one for tomorrow will be on the life of St. on St. John Vianney on his and the anniversary of his, his death. When I was vocation director in Savannah, I used to always say to young men, do you think you're called to be a priest or do you think you're called to marriage? After studying the theology of the body of St. John Paul II, I no longer ask that question. Now I say to young men, to which marriage are you called? A man would not marry a woman because he likes cutting the grass, fixing the toilet, and keeping up the physical plant. That would be madness. A man marries a woman, why? Because he loves her. He does the other things because they're part of the job, right? But he marries her because he loves her. Now we've all had parishioners who've come to us and said, oh, Father, the wife and I, we haven't had a marriage for 30 years, but we, we stayed together, what? For the sake of the kids. You ever heard that? Oh, my gosh. Now, I ask you, is that the right thing to do? Well, every situation is different. I get it. But the most right thing to do is to work on the marriage, isn't it? To rekindle that tenderness and intimacy between bride and groom. I believe priests do the same thing. Sometimes we we stay because we promise. We continue to say our masses and hear our confessions and do the things we promise to do. But sometimes we do it without affect. We do it without love for the people. T.S. Eliot in Murder in the Cathedral has a great line. He said, the last temptation is the greatest treason to do the right thing for the wrong reason. My brothers, I want to invite you on this retreat to work on your marriage, to work on your intimacy with Jesus Christ and with his bride, our church. Blessed are St. John Cardinal Newman's motto, sin tiri cum ecclesia. Brothers, it's not enough to just think with the church. We need to feel with the church too. If our heart is not in it, it changes the way we live as praise. So let's pray on this retreat. Jesus, I need a more intimate relationship with you. I need to feel and experience your love. I want to do it out of love and not just out of holiness. I mean, out of um, duty. Young priests will often say to me on retreats, Father, I've been ordained three years and I'm not the kind of priest I hoped I would be when I was in the seminary. And I always say to them, it's not too late. Ordination is not emancipation from formation. 
is the beginning of our formation. Fifth theology is when we learn the most important things about our lives as priests. Oftentimes I do kind of get frustrated with my own weaknesses and all. And I quote St. John Chrysostom who said, Jesus, if you want me, cut the chains that keep me from you. Because I can't do it. And Jesus says, good, you're learning. You're learning. You're nothing without me. Jesus is everything to us. I'll tell you a little story before I come to an end tonight. Uh, this is a very interesting story of a, a priest who was born here in this country. He was an Irish priest, but he was born here and, and he was at his rectory desk late one Saturday night, finishing off his homily for Sunday mass in the storm, pouring rain, lightning and thunder outside. And there was a phone call. This was back in the day with the phones were on the walls. He picks up the phone and, as you can imagine, often 1130 on a Saturday night in a rainstorm. Not good news. It was the hospital. Father, there's a man. He's dying. He's asked to see a priest. And you come. The priest, of course, felt that pain we've all felt of like, oh, he was exhausted. Horrible weather. Long day. Why did he wait till 1130 at night to call? But he got his oils and the Blessed Sacrament he had in his coat. He gets in the car and begins to creep across town in the pouring rain. Telephone lines are falling. Police are out. He's noticing closing off intersections. He could barely creep through the, uh, through the storm. He finally gets to the hospital. He gets up to the room. He's soaking wet. There's a man emaciated from cancer. And he says, I'm Father so-and-so. They told me that you wanted to see a priest. And the man looked at him and said, yes, I did, but I changed my mind. Well, the priest, as we've all done so many times, the nurse said, you're very ill. You could die this very night. Don't you want to receive, go to confession, receive Holy Communion, the apostolic pardon, anoint of the sick? Uh, the man refused to answer. He wouldn't say a word. The priest looked around. He finally said, well, I've come all this way. He said, I, I think I'll just sit over here and I'm just going to, I'm going to pray my rosary for you. And he, he pulls his rosary out of his pocket and he sat down on the couch and he began to pray out loud. He got about halfway around the rosary and the man lying in the bed. Finally, he turned and he said, all right, Father, all right. I know God can't forgive me. I know I'm going to hell. But I might as well. I might as well tell you. And he told the priest this story. He said, Father, he said, I'm an alcoholic. I've been an alcoholic since I was 15 years old. And he said, by trade, I was an engineer. I drove a train. And he said, many years ago, I was driving the train late at night and I was drunk. I came through a small town and I saw a car, a station wagon, coming to cross the track. I knew what to do, but it takes a long time to start a train when you stop it. So instead of stopping the train, I blew the horn and I threw down the throttle to try to beat that car through the, the intersection and I hit the car. I killed an entire family, father, mother, two little girls. I've been in prison. I'm now dying of cancer. I know God can't forgive me. I guess I just wanted, the priest said, what year did that happen? And the man told him, and the priest said, what town did it happen in? And the man told him, and the priest said, if I can forgive you, God can forgive you. That was my mother and father and my two little sisters in that car. My brothers, the man was so moved by this magnanimity of this priest that he was able to make his confession before he died. My brothers, we all know everything that happens in my life can make me better or bitter, and I choose. Everything that happens in your life can make you better or bitter, 
and you choose. I think John the 23rd said it so cleverly. I quote, he said, men are like wine. Some turn to vinegar, but the best get better with age. We've all had many things that have happened to us, good and bad in our lives as priests. But Jesus can work through all of that to make us the kind of priest we hoped to be when we were in the seminary. I'll close tonight by simply telling you something that has happened to me about 15 years ago. And um, it was just, I was in life, the last years of my work as a vocation director. I was pastor of a parish. And uh, it was a time in my life when prayer was very hard. It was very dry. I heard nothing when I prayed. I was very frustrated with prayer. Vocations weren't going well. It was just a time when we've all been through them, haven't we? Just a time when things were hard. I had the Saturday evening mass. And um, after the mass was over, uh, a 12-year-old boy comes, comes running out. His mom and dad there right with him. He hugs me and he says, Father, we're going to do my favorite things tonight. We're going to my favorite pizza restaurant. And then we're going bowling. And I said, well, that's wonderful. Y'all have a wonderful evening. And off they went. Now, this little boy had been, his parents couldn't have any children for many years. They desired children so badly. We prayed for them. Finally, they had conceived this child. But when he was born, he had some problems. He had a, a little small hole in his heart. The doctors had fixed it as an infant. He was doing great. He played on our football team. He was a normal kid. And they called me at midnight. The hospital called me to tell me to come quickly. He had taken the bowling ball, and as soon as he rolled the ball, he turned and he grabbed his heart and he fell. And the doctors told me he was dead before he hit the ground. His heart had just exploded. And I remember driving to the hospital and I remember saying, Jesus, I can't bury a child right now. I am not strong enough to bury a child. Help me. As you can imagine, thousands of people at the funeral. So tragic. I made it through the homily with the grace of God. I remember clearly getting into the hearse and saying, it's almost over. Thank you, Jesus. We got to the cemetery, the rite of committal. And after my part was over, the mother stood up and she said to the funeral director, open the casket. I want to say goodbye to my son. And the funeral director looked at me as if to say, please say no, Father. How could I, how could I say no? Your only child. And so I nodded. And as you can imagine, she started just started screaming. She fell. Her husband was there, her family. They just were holding on to the casket and she was screaming. It was it was the lowest moment in my entire life as a Catholic priest. And I turned and I started walking through the graves. I just acted like I was looking for a, a tomb, but I was trying to compose myself. And brothers, I heard Jesus speak to me very clearly. He said, thank you. And I understood. I know that when he said those one word, that, that, those two words, thank you. I went from the lowest place I've ever been to the highest place. I could have done anything for him. And I immediately began to say, Jesus, thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you for dying for me. And thank you for calling me to be a priest when I tried to throw it away. And thank you for forgiving me. And the Lord just said, stop it. Right now, I just want you to let me thank you. And I walked through the cemetery saying, you're welcome, Jesus. I'm so glad that I'm a priest. And my brothers, that's the message that I believe the Lord wanted me to say to you tonight as we start our retreat. Thank you so much for being a priest. For 
all the masses and all the confessions and all the homilies and all the aggravation. As you go to sleep tonight, maybe just see the Lord standing above you. And just let him thank you. Don't interrupt him like I do. And then just say, you're welcome, Lord. I love you too. And sleep this first night of your retreat in peace. May God, who has begun this good work in you, bring it to fulfillment. Amen. Good night, brothers. Anybody have any, Monsignor, did you have anything else you wanted to? No, no, thank you, Brother Chris. Tomorrow morning, 9.30 in the morning. May God bless each and every one of you this evening. Did you have anything, Brett? Would you like yes, to well, conclude with a little prayer as amen. for this evening? Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father, we love you so much, and we thank you for the privilege of being on retreat. Jesus, we ask for life-changing graces. We laugh for, well, you know what we need, Lord. We ask that please give us the grace to make ourselves radically available to you. Fill us with your goodness and love so that we can one day hear those words from your lips. Well done, good and faithful servant. Blessed Mother Mary, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. Blessed Stanley Arthur, pray, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank everybody. you, Brett. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, Brett.